Folks, <laughs> seated, please. All right, we've got two really good panels to finish up the day. I know BIB sometimes feels like a stretch at, after you get past the one and a half day mark, but it's always worth it. It makes those drinks at the end of the day so much nicer. Come on, please. Come in. Take a seat. All right. This is the Canadian panel, as Hugh pointed out to me. So we're starting off with uh, John and Haig. Thanks. So hi, everybody. I'm John Maxwell from the publishing program at SFU. And my name's Haig Armand from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Hello, eh? <laughs> hey. So uh, in June, we ran this uh, week-long experimental workshop, um, Creating Digital Fiction with Kate Pullinger. Um, Kate's a, a kind of a fixture at, at uh, Books and Browsers, except uh, not this year. Although I think there's a Books and Browsers tradition where uh, her face always appears on screen. So here's Kate. Um, she may be with us in, in Twitter. I'm not sure. She's actually trapped in Vancouver, not because of flooding, but because of the International Writers Festival there. So she's uh, rubbing shoulders with all the other literary Illuminati. Um, anyway, we did this workshop with her in June that was actually the idea of it was born at last year's Books and Browsers Conference, um, Creating Digital Fiction with Kate Pullinger, which was billed as a collaborative writing and production workshop uh, to do an original piece of digital fiction inspired and directed uh, by Kate, who is an acknowledged pioneer in the field, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so what does that mean? We don't really know. It was a little bit like a book sprint. We're um, huge fans of Adam Hyde and the book sprints idea, um, but we were not looking at a book. We were aiming at building a piece of multimodal, on-screen fiction, multimedia, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and besides that, we don't actually know jack about book sprints. Uh, if you want to know about that, ask Adam. <laughs> so uh, that was the idea. We brought together uh, about a dozen people. Uh, we gathered largely academics, grad students, writers, editors from all over the place, actually, some really, really smart people. Um, we wanted to do the whole thing with open web technologies. That's kind of a... Uh, an important point for us, and that was part of what we wanted to try out with this. Uh, so a lot of the kind of basic web production tools and techniques that are used to build all kinds of reading experiences, from the open web to ebooks to other kinds of things. Um, and we also brought, or I guess rather Kate brought with her, uh, her Flight Paths uh, interactive novel uh, in actually these big folders full of raw material. It was all busted apart rather than the, the finished product. Uh, the idea that that would be kind of seed content uh, to work with, so we weren't starting completely from scratch. And so over the week, five days with these, uh, these people, uh, we developed a storyline and characters and a script and uh, imagery and animation ideas and audio and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the result being The Last Cartographer, uh, which I like to call it a neo-Diluvian tale of love uh, and loss. Uh, but the real goal, uh, for us anyway, was uh, is sort of the experimental process of it, to discover new tools, new processes, to collaborate and boldly go where nobody had ever gone before. Uh, so it wasn't just this week, really. Uh, Haig and I spent three or four weeks in advance uh, hacking and trying to build some scaffolding around the thing. Um, we spent the week with our uh, dozen participants. Uh, and then Haig went back in September and spent a whole bunch more time uh, tuning things up and then also uh, working with it further with his design students at Emily Carr. So there was, there was quite a bit more to it than that. Uh, the whole project was pretty ambitious and open-ended. There wasn't really a particular goal in mind. It was pretty experimental, really. So despite having good advice, um, we, we only really had two of these. Uh, we had a good venue and we had good people. Um, we did not cater the event, and I, I take it that's probably the wrong thing to do. Uh, and we didn't really have an experienced book sprint facilitator uh, at all. Um, so we had 15 hungry people in a room and uh, lots of computers, lots of pieces of paper and that sort of thing. And we developed a workflow 
out of that, uh, which started with a lot of sketching on stickies and index cards and big pieces of paper, uh, lots of storyboarding and sketching and assembling of ideas. And then those ideas were digested into a wiki uh, using Markdown uh, and uh, a whole sort of notation system that we developed so that we could pipeline that into this thing, which we used as our kind of target uh, deployment framework. Uh, if it, has anybody encountered DeckJS? It's a really lovely HTML5 slide presentation framework, but it's, it's jQuery based, it's very elegant, very extensible. So we use that as kind of the beginnings uh, of what we wanted to do. Um, using Pandoc, we built a little sort of production pipeline where we could go from sort of a script, a production script of what we wanted. This is in the wiki, so all of our participants could play with it and you know, iteratively develop this. Notations in there for background images, foreground bits, audio, all of those sorts of things. Run it through Pandoc and build into the templates that DeckJS needed. That sounded like a pretty good ar arrangement anyway. Um, we wanted to kind of hide a lot of the complexity of the code uh, behind the scenes so that we could allow our team of writers to mostly think about story and work on this kind of production script idea and rather than working directly in the code. At least that was the idea. Hey. So I'm gonna start by giving you a sense of how the workshop went. As John mentioned, we had 11 writers uh, and these writers, we expected them to write. They did a little bit of writing and they did a lot of that writing on paper. As you can see, large pieces of paper, small index cards, not a lot of computing going on at this point. So these 11 writers uh, are experienced writers. We were expecting a lot more writing, but what we got was a lot more drawing. Uh, we ended up with a lot of storyboarding. Um, which is very interesting to us, uh, and we'll get back to why we think that's interesting. It's, uh, so these storyboards gave us this impression that they had uh, this idea that there was a background image and some sort of text um, that was uh, superimposed over it. Where did this idea come from? Uh, was it possibly that Kate was talking about flight paths and that influenced them a lot or perhaps I showed them CBC Radio 3 and that was very much an uh, image and text um, um, combination. But really what it came down to was this is a pattern that we all know very well. We've read a lot of children's books, picture books, and so this mental model of how to tell a story I think is very deeply ingrained um, I, want to, uh, I want to talk about how the flow happened. It, it really started on these cards. There was a lot of shuffling. There was a lot of experimentation that happened on these cards. Uh, and that quickly moved from these cards into the wiki, as John explained, and then moved straight to um, DeckJS that um, gave us this kind of digital version of the index cards. So I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm just going to show, oops, sorry, I'm going to hop over to, uh, this is the last cartographer, and I'm just going to quickly uh, click through to one of the sections. I won't show you a lot, it's all online, uh, you'll be able to um, view it, we've just published the address for it. You don't have audio, do you? There's audio. Yeah, I should mention that there's actually a layer of audio as well. Uh, so, I don't want to show too much, we don't have a lot of time here, but um, then quickly going to switch over to one of the, it's all right, that's fine, yeah, thanks. I'm going to quickly uh, switch over to what my Emily Carr students ended up doing. So I gave them a lot of the raw materials, I uh, gave them all the index cards so they had to kind of piece it all together, and uh, gave them the, the challenge of um, you can use whatever tools you like. I, I made it specific that they didn't have to use uh, DeckJS. They could just build it in whatever way they wanted. And they came, this is one of the four different groups. So one of them made this responsive website that 
um, is a long horizontal scroll with a soundtrack. So a little bit, well, a very different way to tell this story, but interesting. And then that's all I wanted to show you for now. On to you. So the interesting tension of this is, is we wanted to do digital fiction and we end up doing a lot on paper. And we started, Hague and I tried to think about that a lot. And I, I could tell you this little interlude here is this thing, in the weeks before we actually ran the workshop, um, while we were, Hague and I were working back and forth on evaluating technology and figuring out how to build the scaffold for this, we started this little throwaway story, which I started out once upon a time there was a wolf. And, and then I wrote a few slides trying out combinations of media and then Hague contributed a little bit of this and bounced it back and forth just as a kind of, you know, <laughs> testing, testing kind of a thing. Um, and it was a little bit between the two of us, it was kind of like a little jam session, right? We were just, just playing with the tools. We were tuning up. We are literally tuning up the instruments for this, uh, for this, you know, this performance that was going to happen in, in June. And in a sense, we were, we were improvising, right? We were going, oh, well, you know, you could play with this. We were, we were improvising in the raw materials, in, in Markdown and in raw HTML and in CSS and, and playing with jQuery and that sort of thing. And, and that's possible for us because between the two of us, we have like 40 years of web development experience. I mean, we really are that old. Um, but the difference there, of course, is our participants in the workshop don't have that kind of experience. And so they were able to improvise using paper. And that's a really important kind of distinction there uh, to make. Because um, what do you do with that in the future actually trying to facilitate a story? So we have three basic reflections on the workshop as we move forward. Um, the first one being the role of proficiency. The second, we saw tools really, really shape the outcomes. And finally, we wanted to make a distinction, as John said, between the composing and of improvising within this, this form. So the deal with proficiency, right, is that the better your, your understanding and your, your fluidity with the, the material and the, the materiality of whatever your medium is, even if you're just dealing with, with code, uh, the, the deeper you go with that, the more sophisticated can be your, your forms of expression, right? Um, the nice thing about paper is that everybody is above the critical threshold on that one. Uh, it doesn't get in the way of you playing with ideas. Um, with software, uh, the software only gets out of your way if you already know your way through it reasonably well. There's probably a whole bunch of you in the audience that are at this level, right, where you can sit there and, and hack away at code and look at your results and go back and forth and do that meaningfully. You're above a really actually pretty high threshold and there's lots of people that are not at that threshold. So you get these kind of different um, modalities, right? Writing is really easy. Everybody knows how to do this because we all went to school. You know, we've grown up in a, in a culture that for hundreds of years has done this. Uh, drawing and sketching is actually something that's still, it's pretty good. I mean, you don't have to be good at it. Uh, you don't have to have any particular talent, but we can all, you know, rough out thumbnails or something like that. But when we get into actually trying to develop interactive media, we end up in this. So you're either dealing with prepackaged canned functionality or we're playing with code. And I, I think there's an aesthetic, right, and, and a value in the open web platform that that code should be open or the black boxes should even be open. But now we no longer are able to play with it, or not we, but a lot of people are not able to, to play with it at that level. So, so that's the thing about proficiency, right? There's a, there's a bar that gets set. And so when it comes to tools and frameworks, what we realized was that the tools not only in, uh, imply a certain design patterns, but they also in, sometimes insist on those design patterns. Um, I have a colleague, uh, her name's Celeste Martin at Emily Carr, and she's done a lot of work uh, trying to describe all the different design patterns that are, are, that are commonly used in eBooks. Uh, I'm gonna run through just three that are the most common ones. We have uh, what she calls the hanging chapters. We all know this paradigm, um, and here's an, an example of it in New, York, New Yorker magazine, and commonly used by Adobe's DPS system. Second is uh, what she calls the stacked scroll, or st stacked scrolls. Um, here's an example of it, the history of graphic design, and that, um, not only Inkling, but Inkling's tools give you a very easy way of getting into this type of pattern. And then finally, the one that John and I have been talking about for, it seems, years, 
the index cards, uh, this pattern is the, probably the most common. You're viewing one right now, it's a presentation. And um, a really uh, popular example of this is our choice. And, uh, and the tool that a lot of people use for this pattern is the iBooks author. What we found was that these templates or design metaphors are so ingrained in the tools that to get beyond them actually takes a lot of work sometimes. And um, this is why we didn't feel that we should start our workshops using tools like this and start with smaller, nimble tools that we can shape um, our story around. So when we're talking about our digi digital publishing universe, we have, uh, sorry, you're not even seeing the stars that you're supposed to be seeing. You can barely see them there. So you, you kind of have a cluster, which is the, uh, the platforms and the standards that are coming about. And what we're looking for is those interesting experiments that happen along the fringe. The, um, we like to say where the wild things are. So where this kind of came down to for me is, is the difference between a compositional mode and an improvisational mode. Um, in composing, which is I think what we mostly do with digital media, what we mostly do uh, with code, we're looking for efficiencies, we're looking for pipelines, we're looking to be able to, to get from point A to point B the most efficient way. Composing re requires a, a kind of abstracted mentality, right? Um, if you're writing music, you have to be able to imagine what the orchestra sounds like when they're writing the note, when you're writing the notes down, right? Um, or in, in the case of like web development, you have to have a certain sensibility already about what's going to happen when the browser, browser renders this code. Because um, the iteration thing requires, it's taxing, it takes time. You can do, get pretty damn quick at it. And we've all seen people in Vi that are like lightning fast. Um, but that, that requires this abstracted sense. And I think where we really need to get to if something like digital fiction and, or digital literature more generally is really going to be a widespread art form that really pushes things like publishing forward is we need to get to a more of an improvisational space. We have to be able to play with it, right? So that idea from this grainy photograph to this old grainy photograph, um, you know, this guy, Alan Kay, this is about 1976 at Xerox Park. Alan Kay was all about the idea of direct manipulation. Direct manipulation is what you need in order to improvise, in order to play with the tools that you want. Alan Kay was building systems for kids, right? They weren't for us, they were for children. Or, I mean, maybe we were children back then in the 70s. Um, that the idea is that he wanted us to be able to improvise in software. And the idea there was that you didn't have tools that were pre-cooked, you, you built your own tools. And improvisation was about building a repertoire of tools and being able to put them together for novel you know, ideas and applications as you went along. So maybe instead of making tools for authors to build publications, which is what most people are looking at. It would be nice if we could get to a point where we're building tools for authors to build their own tools, to be able to explore that space. So that's kind of where we got to with this, and, and I'd like to end it on this kind of Dr. Seussian note of like, well, so what do you do? What would you do if your mother asked you? If we were to run this thing again, and we're, you know, we're in talks about running another workshop um, in June. Uh, how do you do that? How do you encourage an improvisational space uh, so that people can really play with digital media as opposed to just designing and then running it through a pipeline and seeing the results on the other end? We would love to hear from you. If you'd like to play with our stuff, uh, it's all at this website, digitalpathways.net. There are many digital pathways. Ours is the one that's .net. Um, the Last Cartographer, if you want to play with that, it's there. Uh, and there's a whole lot of blog posts and, and commentary and whatnot around there, including a copy of our slides. Send us email, too. Thank you very much. Thank you.